Good morning, Grace St. Paul's. Good morning. How's my juice there, James? Is that good? Seems a little bit lower than before. Okay. Welcome. Welcome to Trinity Sunday. We're so happy you are here. Uh, the other thing that we like to say about Trinity Sunday is that it's Altar Guild Sunday. That's because this is the only time of the year when we have to change all of the frontals in the church three consecutive times in a row. Red for Pentecost, white for Trinity Sunday, green for ordinary time. And we had two burials in the middle of this, so our altar guild's been changing things every moment. So, so there you go. <clears throat> it's always fun. Uh, a few announcements for you. Uh, this is camp, uh, children's camp week, and that starts Tuesday. So uh, if you don't have your kids or your grandkids or anyone signed up for camp, uh, you might want to make that happen tomorrow um, or just bring them in Tuesday morning and we'll get them signed up. <clears throat> we do have limited attendance, so, uh, so get, get them in there. And I think we've, we do have a few spaces left. So uh, if you can get them in there on Tuesday morning at 9 o'clock, that would be great. All right? Very good. Our youth trip is also coming up. That is July 24th to 31st. Our youth are going to the mountains of Colorado to visit Pastor Kimberly's churches uh, in uh, three regions of Colorado. And they are going by way of the desert southwest, of course. And they are doing a uh, half-day raft trip down the Colorado. And they got all kinds of fun stuff. I, I wish I was going. So anyway, uh, youth get signed up for that July 24th to 31st. Get everybody signed up. Uh, I don't know if you are all aware of uh, our friend a Pew, who is uh, doing a camp counseling uh, starting. He was supposed to start last Sunday. But a pew was in a uh, rollover car accident Sunday going up to camp. Uh, after I saw the vehicle, I don't know how anyone survived that, but a pew came out of it not only okay, but without any broken bones. Um, he is dealing with some uh, oxygen issues and some, and some other things, but for the most part, he is recovering and okay. So please keep a pew in your prayers and uh, his family, John and Daruka, and all the rest of the kids. Uh, he is headed back to camp to continue to do counseling, but it was a crazy night, Sunday night. Let me tell you, I spent an awful lot of time on the phone with the nurses up there trying to, to, uh, to help out. So anyway, a pew's getting better, so, so thank you for that. And uh, just wanted you all be aware that that was going on. Uh, no Sunday school today, as I think you figured out. We do have nursery, but not Sunday school, as uh, Jessica is still at camp and coming back for, for our camp next week. So uh, just so you're aware on that front. A reminder, bread ministry. Anybody who's thinking maybe they would like to make bread for communion, uh, we have the recipe for you. Please contact the office or the Reverend Don Eager. Uh, he's coordinating that for us now. And we'd love to get you signed up on that, so that would be great. Thank you very much. Uh, this coming Saturday, uh, our friend Laurie Finn is getting ordained to the diaconate. So please keep, yep, uh, Laurie in your prayers. Yep, it's very, very exciting stuff. She was here for the 745 service. I stood here waiting for her to do this dismissal, and then she's still a lay person. She can't do the dismissal yet. <laughs> So that will happen Saturday, and uh, uh, that is happening at the cathedral in Phoenix. Uh, it is limited attendance, so unfortunately, uh, what you need to do is watch it on YouTube after the fact, but uh, that will be available to you to do. But please keep Laurie in your prayers. It's always uh, an amazingly fun time. And uh, I see that Paul Impey is here, our Paul stand -up. Stand up so people know you. Yay, so. <clears throat> so Paul has survived his first uh, year at Church Divinity School of the Pacific in the middle of a pandemic. Um, the first year's hard enough. Doing it in the middle of a pandemic is something else. 
So, uh, so Paul's passed all the hard stuff, and uh, he's, he's well on his way. So, so happy to see Paul here. Very, very exciting stuff. So thanks for that, too. And then uh, one other thing I wanted to bring to your attention. June the 9th, we are going to be doing a blessing out in the parking lot at 7 p.m. for our friends from Apache Stronghold. That's the group that's pre- uh, working to preserve Oak Flat. Uh, the area on the Apache Reservation uh, that they're trying to build a copper mine. So, uh, so we're going to be blessing them and, uh, and helping them with their efforts June the 9th. We are just hosting that event. It's an indigenous event, and we are invited. So uh, we'll be doing a blessing for them, sending them off. But, uh, but that's, I'm really glad and honored that we get to do that. That's June the 9th, 7 p.m., right out here in the parking lot. All right, quickly, uh, some of you know that uh, we now on our U- Grace St. Paul's YouTube channel have a, uh, a tour of our stained glass windows in the church. So I commend that to you. It's getting rave reviews, so check that out. That's very cool. And then I uh, wanted to tell you about the next steps in our process here. Uh, The thing that the liturgy committee is continually talking about is when can we sing again as a congregation? And then, of course, the next step would be uh, mask wearing and maybe when we get to the point where at least uh, those up here cannot be wearing masks and maybe get to the next step after that. We've decided that um, waiting for herd immunity could be quite a long time. So um, we're going to poll all of you, if you're comfortable with that, and get uh, where you are in this process and use those percentages to see if we can, we can push this along a little bit, okay, and make this happen a little bit. So I hope you're comfortable with that. Uh, we'll be sending a poll uh, to you electronically, uh, digitally, and also have them here for you to fill out, uh, and we should have that for you by next week, okay? So that's the plan, and the, the hope is that, that maybe we can, we can get to the next steps here. So that's where we are. All right, and then just quickly a reminder for communion. Communion is in one kind. There will be two stations, and they will be standing stations right here. So uh, just come, come up in one row from the center and peel off to either one and return by the side aisles all the way back into the narthex and back up. Okay? Does that make sense? We are so happy you are here on the one Sunday a year when we talk about a dogma rather than a feast. Trinity Sunday. Welcome.
Jesus calls, inviting us in. Holy, holy, holy God, we gather as your children. The Spirit calls, inviting us to listen. Holy, holy, holy Christ, we sit at your feet. The Father calls, adopting us as family. Holy, holy, holy Spirit, we come to worship. Amen. May the Trinity be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Holy Trinity, you are neither monarch nor monologue, but an eternal harmony of gift and response. Through the uncreated word and the spirit of truth, include us and all creation in your extravagant love. Through the wisdom of God, who raises her voice to call us to life. Una lectura de Isaías. El año en que murió el rey Osías, vi al Señor sentado en un trono muy alto. El borde de su manto llenaba el templo. Unos seres como de fuego estaban por encima de él. Cada uno tenía seis alas. Con dos alas, se cubrían la cara, con otras dos se cubrían la parte inferior del cuerpo y con las dos volaban y se decían el uno al otro, Santo, Santo, Santo es el Señor, todo poderoso, toda la tierra está llena de su gloria. Al resonar esta voz, las puertas del templo temblaron y el templo mismo se llenó de humo. Y pensé, ay de mí, voy a morir. He visto con mis ojos al Rey, el Señor Todopoderoso. Yo, que soy un hombre de labios impuros y vivo en medio de un pueblo con labios impuros. En ese momento, uno de aquellos seres como de fuego, voló hacia mí. Con unas tenazas sostenía una brasa que había tomado de encima del altar y tocándome en la boca, me dijo, mira, esta brasa ha tocado tus labios. Tu maldad te ha sido quitado. Tus culpas te han sido perdonados. Entonces, Oí la voz del Señor que decía, ¿a quién, ¿a quién voy a enviar? ¿Quién será nuestro mensajero? 
Yo respondí, aquí estoy yo, envíame a mí. Oigan lo que el Espíritu está diciendo al pueblo de Dios.
The Holy Gospel of our Savior, Jesus Christ, according to John. Glory to you, O Christ. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one else can do these, things, these signs that you do of heart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into a mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of heaven without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I had told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Jesus lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. The good news of Jesus Christ. Praise to you, O Christ. Anyone who can worship a trinity and insist that his religion is a monotheism can believe anything. Robert A. Heinlein, amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> this God has taken his place in the divine council, in the midst of the gods he holds judgment. Who is like you, O God, among all the gods? For you are a great God and a great King above all gods. Praise, O heavens, his people. Worship him, all you gods. Now, all of these quotes are standard fare in the religious practice of the world's polytheistic religions. They are examples of professions of faith to a particular God among a pantheon of gods. You get a sense that the God being praised here holds a special place within the divine council of the gods. But it is obvious that there are plenty of gods in the mix. If someone tossed these quotes at me and asked me to guess from which religious tradition they emerged, I would probably go with Hinduism 
the ancient wisdom that has an emphasis on a creator deity among a long list of gods. Now, some would describe the distance between Hinduism and our own religious tradition as the most vast of them all. After all, Judaism is the birthplace of monotheism, and Hinduism is the root for all polytheistic religions. But guess what? All of those quotes come straight out of the Hebrew Bible. It's Psalm 82, Exodus 15, Psalm 95, and Deuteronomy 32, respectively. How can it be that the religion that invented monotheism is saturated with comparisons of our God with all the other gods? The truth is that for the bulk of Hebrew history, Jews were just as polytheistic as every other religion on earth. Our sacred text is saturated with my God is better than your God apologetics, including in the psalm appointed for today, Psalm 29, where the Hebrew God is described as more powerful than Yam, the Canaanite God of the sea. Slowly, very slowly over the centuries, Hebrews grew in the belief that their God was more powerful than the other gods. That belief became so prevalent that it eventually made in their minds the other gods inconsequential. It was not that the other gods did not exist, but rather that they saw those other deities as impotent compared to theirs. Now, I believe this distinction is important to understand in light of what I am about to suggest. Let me immediately preface this statement by making it clear that what I am about to say would be considered heretical in many circles. You're really surprised, aren't you? <laughs> but the evidence seems incontrovertible to me. If we define monotheism as a belief in a single being who is God, I believe that our Jewish ancestors were never literally monotheistic. Not only did they continually participate in comparing their God to the gods of the gigantic empire surrounding them, but I would also suggest something even more dramatic. The evidence points to the fact that our Hebrew ancestors did not even understand their God as one being. Now before you get online with the presiding bishop's office to report me as an apostate, let me state my case first, then you can do it, okay? I'm going to begin with the word Elohim. Elohim is used extensively in the Hebrew Bible, and we have all been told that Elohim is one of the names for God in the text. True. But what no one seems to talk about is that Elohim is unquestionably a plural noun. Elohim sometimes refers to the gods of other regions, and sometimes it refers to the gods of Israel but it always refers to more than one. Now some have attempted to skirt around this by suggesting that this is prosaic language like you might hear somebody use today when they are trying to be humble. You know what I mean, they say we did this when they really mean I did this. The royal we as we sometimes hear it called. But the fact that Elohim refers to multiple gods in other traditions discounts that possibility. In addition, we know this because only gods are referred to in the Hebrew scriptures in the first person plural. Elohim is never used in the singular. Okay, so the first use of Elohim is, of course, in the first sentence of the Bible. In the beginning, Elohim the gods of Israel created the heavens and the earth. A few verses later, Elohim speaks, let us make humankind in our image. Us, our. A couple chapters later, then the eternal one said, 
See, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. Now let's jump up to the Tower of Babel story in chapter 11. Elohim is apparently speaking to his cohorts. Come, let us go down and confuse their language there so that they will not understand one another's speech. And now, today's first reading. Did you notice? Could you pick this up in Spanish? I'm sure you might not have even picked it up in English. Then I heard the voice of the Eternal One saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? One more. Proverbs 8. Now these are the words of the wisdom woman, Sophia in Greek. Who exactly is the wisdom woman? Well, that is still open to conjecture. But what she says is not. The Eternal One created me at the beginning of His work, the first of His acts of long ago. Ages ago I was set up at the first, before the beginning of the earth. Okay, so even if all these were isolated cases, they would certainly be enough to convince me of the multiplicity of God in Hebrew theology. But when we remember that the pl plural Elohim is used 2,500 times throughout the text, I am left to believe that there is no other possibility other than the fact that God is plural in the Jewish tradition. Now, obviously, somewhere along the way, this multiplicity of Godness was either set aside or lost. And we can talk about that, but I'm not going to go there today. We know that because when Christianity comes on the scene, what happens? People start suggesting that they had experienced God through a human being and then through the presence of a wind and a flame and everything explodes. How can a church that came out of the tradition of monotheism possibly suggest that God is anything but singular? How could the author of the fourth gospel suggest to us today that Christ and the Spirit also come from above, from the same place as God? Unlike the Hebrew text, the idea of multiple modes of God is only alluded to in the Christian scriptures. But as the centuries go on, this becomes the central focus of contention in the church. How do we believe in a creator, a divine presence on earth, and a free-flowing spirit, and still call ourselves monotheistic? Now, as all of you know all too well, that conversation would become the most contentious and violent internal struggle in the church's history. Bishops would be murdered over the topic, and the creeds that were written to settle the issue would do nothing of the sort. In the end, it was only linguistic semantics by some brilliant Eastern theologians that allowed the church to accept the oxymoronic dogmatic statement that we are both monotheistic and Trinitarian. Three hypostasis in one ousia, three persons in one essence. Yeah, that's it, that's it. What? I should have let Paul do this sermon. He just did this. So could it be, beloved, that the concept of a multiplicity of God was not actually foreign to Jewish theologians at all? Could it be that both Judaism and Christianity were trying to say the same thing? Could it be that the plurality of God has always existed, even in the monotheistic traditions? Could it be that the religious wars and violence that has occurred over thousands of years, both between and within religions, are actually all misunderstandings of what we believe? That is my thesis for you this morning. I do not believe that the difference between monotheism and polytheism is theological at all. I believe the issue is and always has been linguistic. 
It is my contention that every great wisdom tradition believes in the multiplicity of God, including Judaism. The problem is that none of us have ever had the language to describe what this means, leaving us to misinterpret Hebrew texts and then create all those Trinitarian controversies that go on for generations, that even after they are solved, nobody really understands. Maybe Paul does right now, but none of the rest of us. But folks, the times, they are a-changing. It is not that suddenly we have new religious language to describe God. I'm not sure we are any closer to that than we were when the Cappadocians came up with homoousios. But in the last couple years, we have added something to our secular lexicon that I believe can make all the difference for religions. Pronouns. Somebody got that. Before I said it. Of course, we have always had pronouns, but now we are using them to identify ourselves to others. We are honoring each individual's preference to choose the gender pronouns that most match how they understand themselves. Now, this is a really nice step forward in how we relate to one another. But in doing this, something else happened we unconsciously added something entirely new to the English language. He and she have not changed, but now there is that third option. They, them. Of course, the main reason to use they, them is to create a gender-neutral way to address someone. But what they, them has also done is given us another choice in English that we have never had before. We now have a gender-neutral third-person singular personal pronoun. Now it is grammatically acceptable to use the term they in the singular. Now I don't want to overplay this, but could it be that this is the language for God that we've always been searching for throughout the centuries? Could it be that it really is that simple? God is they. God is them. God is, by definition, plural, and by usage, one. God is not gender-specific. God is both female and male. God is at the same time one God singular and a multiplicity of God's plural. If God's pronouns are they, them, theirs, the entire Trinitarian controversy goes away. We don't need an usia and a hypostasis anymore because God's pronouns cover all those things. In the same way, if God's pronouns are they, them, theirs, all those Hebrew Bible references suddenly start to make sense. In addition, the chasm between Hinduism and Judaism disappears. The theological disconnection between Islam and Christianity no longer pertains. Now, am I saying that the word they used in the singular means that all of the world's wisdom traditions should blend into one? No, of course not. That misses the point. God is they, and so must we be they. God is multiplicity, and we must be the same. But if we can agree that God is they, we become more alike than we are different. We can understand the common roots found in all of our traditions. God is both monotheistic and polytheistic. The Hindus were right the whole time. The Buddhists are right. The Muslims are right. The Jews are right. And the Christians are right. When God becomes they, all of the great wisdom traditions understanding of them need no further explanation. God is plural, and not only does that make the Trinity make sense without us jumping through semantic hoops, but it reconnects us with our Jewish roots. God as them also makes it clear that God's essence is always about relationship. 
They relate to one another as we are called to relate to one another. God, as they, diagrams for us the makeup of all creation, a system that only operates when all parts of the planet are in relationship with each other. God as they means that God is not just far away from us, but indwelling in the entire globe, a part of every aspect of creation. God as they means that the planet is part of God, and we must treat it as if it is. God as they means that we must also be in a symbiotic relationship with nature if we are to image God. God as they means that monotheism cannot be used as a legitimization of centralized forms of government and religious structures. The intimacy of the relationships of God as they are also our model for what our relationship must be with all who are oppressed, whether they be human or any part of God's creation. God as they is our model of inclusion of the other. God as they points us toward creating social institutions that honor our relationship among all people, all rivers, all forests, all deserts, and all wildlife. God as they is the essence of the community that we've always sought. When God is they, there is no more monotheism, monotheism, beloved. There's no polytheism. Our understanding of God coheres with each other. There are no more crazy formulas to describe how we can be both Trinitarian and monotheistic. Just remember God's pronouns and the multiplicity of God becomes one. Just remember God's pronouns and the multiplicity of our religious traditions becomes one. Just remember God's pronouns and the multiplicity of this nation becomes our strength again. Just remember God's pronouns and the multiplicity of nature makes us one with it. They, they are with us, beloved. Let us celebrate the God who is they. Amen. Let us say the affirmation of faith. God above us, God beside us, God within us. Starting on page 12. We believe in God above us, maker and sustainer of all life, of sun and moon, of water and earth, of male and female. We believe in God beside us, Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh, born of a woman, servant of the poor, tortured and nailed to a tree. A man of sorrows, he died forsaken. He descended into the earth, to the place of death. On the third day he rose from the tomb. He ascended into heaven to be everywhere present, and his kingdom will come on earth. We believe in God within us, the Holy Spirit of Pentecostal fire, life-giving breath of the church, spirit of healing and forgiveness, source of resurrection and of eternal life. Amen. 
God of all that is good, in scripture you give us your vision for the world. In love you give us your grace. In wisdom you give us each other. Through the vision of your trinity, we learn that your very hope is that we be your presence, your power, and your body in the world. For this we give you thanks, and as one body, offer ourselves and each other as we pray. We pray for every community of faith. God, who unites us all, bless, bless your, your holy, holy people. people. God of justice and truth, we pray for our nation. God, who calls us to justice and forgives us, open, open our, our hearts, hearts to receive your truth. Help us reach out to the world. God, who makes power of powerlessness, Make, Make us, us channels of justice, justice and peace. We pray for those who suffer. God, who enfolds us in your own wounds. Open our hearts to know the healing power of your love. We pray for those who have died. On this Memorial Day weekend, we give thanks for all who have lost their lives for the cause of freedom. God of forever and from before time, we, we praise you for the wonder of eternal life. We thank you for the blessings and surprises of life. Thank you for this church. Mm -hmm. God of all blessings, we, we give you heartfelt thanks and praise. God of heaven and earth, before the foundation of the universe and the beginning of time, you are the triune God, the author of creation, the eternal word of salvation, and the life-giving spirit of wisdom. Guide us to all truth by your Spirit, that we may proclaim all that Christ revealed and rejoice in the glory he shared with us. Glory and praise to you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins to the triune God. Almighty, Almighty God, God in, in our, our pride, we have, we have forgotten, forgotten your holiness and your, your due as creator of all that is. We have we failed to care for your creation. By, by your love and compassion, compassion Holy Mother, Mother correct, correct us when we squander opportunities to care for your creation. Christ our Savior, through indifference and hatred, we have failed to live out your gospel of love for all our sisters and brothers. Forgive us when we create divisions. Holy Spirit, in our addiction to busyness, we have failed to listen to your guidance and have not heeded your call to serve God's kingdom. Amen. God forgives us through an unchanging, enduring love. Be assured that having received the Spirit, we can state with confidence, we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Take heart in the blessing of the wisdom of God, the humanity of God, and the Spirit of God. Amen. Amen. And may the peace of the Trinitarian God be always with you. And, and also with you. Let us offer each other a socially distant sign of peace. <laughs>
The grace of Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. Giver of life, receive all we offer you this day. Let the spirit you bestow on your church continue to work in the world through the hearts of all. Amen. God is with us. God is present here. Rejoice, lift up your hearts. We lift our hearts to the Most High. Let us give thanks to the Holy One. It is right to offer thanks and praise. It is our joy and our hope to offer your praise, gracious God, creator and sustainer of all life. We praise you, Holy Trinity, mystery of being and freedom of the world. In everyone and everything, at all times and in all places, you reveal yourself to us, persistently redeeming our mistakes 
and offering hope in place of despair. And so as the morning stars sing your praises, we join the heavenly beings and all creation as we sing with joy. Jesus' life, we know that you restore to community those who are alone. Outcasts and sinners were offered hope by him. The sick were healed and the hungry fed. Women and men alike were warmed by his magnetic presence and gentle wisdom, and they were challenged by his bold proclamation. But his message was hard for us to hear. It threatened our selfish ambitions and challenged our limited vision. In our fear and ignorance, we contrived with the power of the state, and he was put to death. Yet his message would not die. In raising him again, you have shown all how all things might be redeemed and how our own lives might be made new. And now we bring you this bread and this wine, gifts from your creation formed by human hands. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of Jesus Christ. On the night he was betrayed, he took bread, said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his friends and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, gave thanks, and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Holy God, we recall your self-giving love in Jesus Christ, your gracious gift of reconciliation and hope. Through this holy bread and cup, we show forth the miracle of his life. We commemorate his death, and we proclaim his resurrection. Gather us by this holy communion into one body, and send your Holy Spirit upon us, making our lives a living example of joy and peace. Through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and loves one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. As our Savior Christ has taught us, we now pray. Our, our Father, Father in heaven, heaven hallowed be your name. Your, your kingdom come, come. your you will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the, For the kingdom, kingdom, the power, and the, and the glory, glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Be known to us, risen Christ, in the breaking of the bread. Alleluia! The bread which we break makes all of us one with you. Alleluia! Beloved, this is the body of Christ for the body of Christ. Be what you see. Receive what you are.
Let us pray. As truly as God is our Father, so just as truly is she our Mother. 
in our Father, God Almighty, we have our being. In our merciful Mother, we are remade and restored. Our fragmented lives are knit together. And by giving and yielding ourselves through grace to the Holy Spirit, we are made whole. It is I, the strength and goodness of fatherhood. It is I, the wisdom of motherhood. It is I, the light and grace of holy love. It is I, the Trinity. I am the sovereign goodness in all things. It is I who teach you to love. It is I who teach you to desire. It is I who am the reward of all true desiring. All shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. Amen. Now may the blessing of the God of peace and justice be with us. May the blessing of the Son who weeps the tears of the world's suffering be with us. And may the blessing of the Spirit who inspires us to reconciliation and hope be with us from now into eternity. Amen. forth into the world rejoicing in the power of the Trinity. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah, hallelujah.